when I was thinking about pulling together some remarks, um, you know, it's really interesting. I, I've been talking about Robert Smalls since <laughs> April of 1976. I had an opportunity when I was in eighth grade to unveil the bust of Robert Smalls that is in Tabernacle Baptist Church in Beaufort, where uh, Robert and his family went to church and where he is now interred. And um, so over the, over the years, uh, you know, I, I've gathered some sort of data about these experiences. And they're, they're very special for a variety of different reasons, and this one being particularly special. But, you know, in general, obviously, Robert Smalls is someone who I feel very proud about. And so having an opportunity to talk about him, to share his experiences with others is always a great honor. It's very rare when I do these talks that I am by myself. And so they're frequently uh, sort of reunions of one sort or another um, with family, with friends. You know, I have people here, uh, friends of my, my families who, you know, I've known <laughs> since I was my youngest son's child. And it's just great to see, you know, to, to, to live sort of this experience with family and friends in the way that, uh, that I can. It's also, as I get older, and as I mentioned, I've got, you know, four sons, it's, it's really wonderful to, uh, to sort of model the kind of activity and behavior that they're going to participate in. You know, I see one of my primary responsibilities in life is to raise my sons and uh, to be something of a bridge between past generations to them and, and for them to carry on this tradition with their children. And, uh, you know, as you can probably hear, you know, it's something I take very seriously and it's very important. But today is also, this weekend is, is particularly special. It's the 150th anniversary, but this is also a day, you know, May 12th, May 13th, uh, that I have always noted as this is our personal Independence Day. You know, we of course celebrate July 4th along with the rest of the country, but it's 150 years tomorrow that our family has been free. And, uh, and that's something that, that also is, is particularly meaningful. So what I'd like to do today is share a few thoughts, uh, talk about history, talk about Robert Small's place and role in history. I've got a couple of images that I'd love to share, and then I'd love to leave some time at the end, and if there are any questions, would love to, uh, to take some of those as well. Uh, you know, history is a, is a really powerful force in society, in any society. You know, it helps to, as the mayor was saying, I mean, it helps to sort of define who a people are, who, you know, who they are, what their identity is, um, and probably more importantly, it helps to at least shine a light on what the future can be. And, um, I spent a lot of time with my kids talking about history, talking about their great, great, great grandfather and, and about history. But sometimes it's, it's difficult to put all this history in a context that can be very meaningful for someone who's so young. And it's funny, my, my 10 year old, um, a while ago, we were down at, our, at, at their grandparents, at my parents' home, and we we're talking about slavery. And, uh, you know, he's a very, very sort of, you know, just a warm, innocent, you know, kind of a kind of a personality. And he looked up at his grandfather when we were talking, and he said, Grandpa, were you a slave? <laughs> and it just, it just, you know, it, it sort of made me chuckle, the story, but, you know, for someone who was born in 2001, it's all ancient history. <laughs> so, it's, uh, it's, it's a challenge sometimes. I used to travel to, uh, to the Far East frequently, and one of the times I was in Seoul, Korea, I met with a gentleman um, after hours, and he showed me a book that was um, a history book about his family that listed all of the generations, you know, hundreds of generations uh, going back. And I did some research afterward, and, you know, people, I guess I understand in the South Korean history, you know, one's identity is almost directly tethered to the contributions and 
uh, the role that ancestors played for them. And so this gentleman was telling me, you know, the, the city of Seoul has been around for 2,000 years. And he was telling me that, you know, here, right here, this, this gentleman, a thousand years ago, was the mayor of Seoul. And I could see just how full, how, how proud that made him. And, uh, and I think, you know, obviously that's the case anywhere. We're all proud of people we're connected to. But that, it leads to a particular challenge, I think, for those of us who are descended from people who were enslaved here in this country. Because, you know, for most of us, even though now we're starting to be able to make connections through DNA testing to various places on the African continent, but for the most part, our history is bookended, you know, at a time that doesn't really engender a lot of self-esteem and, and sort of good feelings in, in terms of slavery. Um, I heard some research that said that um, on average in this country that from the time one is in kindergarten until they graduate from high school, that 95% of the people that students learn about in this country are white males. And that's a wonderful thing if you happen to be a white male, but if you don't and you're not a part of that tradition, then I think it can obviously cause one to question who they are and what their ancestors have done and therefore what f future they might reasonably expect to to live to. And so that's where I think, you know, stories like Robert Smalls, I believe, can be so valuable to the African American community because uh, he achieved enormous things at, you know, astronomical odds. And uh, certainly if Robert Smalls coming from the place that he did and going to the places that, that he eventually did in his life, if he can do it, then hopefully that can provide some measure of, uh, of confidence that young people today can, can do you know, great things. When I, when I think about Robert Smalls and his life, his approach to life, um, uh, I think about a speech that Teddy Roosevelt gave uh, in April of 1910. I'm going to read it really quickly because I think it, it sort of sets the stage in the context for Robert Smalls. And I know most of you probably have heard this, but I'll, I'll say it again. It's, it's not the critic who counts, not the man who points out how the strong man stumbles or where the doer of deeds could have done better. The credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs and comes up short again and again, but who knows the great enthusiasms, the great devotions, who spends himself for a worthy cause, who at the best, in the end, knows the triumph of high achievement, and who at the worst, if he fails, at least he fails while daring greatly, so that his place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who knew neither victory nor defeat. You know, Robert Smalls, he, he lived in the arena from a very young age. He made the conscious decision to, uh, you know, proverbially to stick his neck out in the most acute kinds of ways to, uh, to make things happen for himself and for, for those around him. Um, if he had failed, if Robert Smalls had failed in his efforts, I think he still would be worthy of our acclaim and, our, and, and for, for our affection really about him. But I think the fact that he succeeded and the fact of what he did with his life after commandeering the planner. I think Robert Small should be among the most revered people and personalities in American history. You know, I think about, um, you know, I think about history a lot, and uh, I remember being, you know, rather confused about some things growing up about history. I remember hearing that Christopher Columbus discovered America but yet I couldn't really understand how one could discover a country where there were millions of people who had been here for thousands of years. I didn't, I didn't get that. I, you know, I, I read and heard very uh, profound words. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, and they are endowed with their creator with certain unalienable rights. And among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. 
Yet I came to find out that really that only applied to not just white men, but white men of wealth. So the vast majority of people here, that really didn't apply to. And so it, it caused me, you know, after 20 years of thinking about things, it caused me to really understand that history is as much a tool of culture and a tool of sort of social construction than it is a literal articulation of events. You know, this happened, and then this happened, and then that happened. And again, if, if you happen to be a part of the group that's telling the stories, then that props you up, that sustains you, that helps to you know, give you an identity that can be enormously valuable to you in your life. And if you don't, then you know, that can be enormously problematic. So again, when I think about Robert Smalls and, and his daring efforts, uh, you know, I think, you know, Perhaps if he were, he had done that at a time in this country when race was not such an enormously powerful uh, lens through which p different people viewed things. I mean, he, he could be, uh, again, one of the most important heroes, uh, certainly of the Civil War, but of America. I mean, he had a resume. He leveraged that uh, his 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 history into Congress, but he that's a presidential kind of a resume. What, what he did. Robert Smalls was a man who, he was a man of action. He had the, I, I believe, the, the wonderful ability to envision a reality for himself and for others that did not exist and that might logically not even be expected for one to be able to even dream that high. Um, and I think more importantly, in addition to having those dreams, he then quickly converted that and, and did something about it. And I think that's the beauty, um, and that's one of the things that is most um, just impressive about him to me. You know, he, Robert Smalls, clearly freedom was on his mind 150 years ago. Um, Robert probably had it um, better, and maybe much better than most slaves. He was living on his own, he was here in Charleston, his master was in Beaufort, and uh, he worked on the planter and earned a wage and got a little bit of a stipend that he was able to keep, which he then took and bought tobacco and candies and things and sold in the docks and was able to earn a few extra dollars. And, uh, you know, he, he was married 150 years ago, and he had even negotiated with his wife's master to buy her freedom. And so, you know, he was a man clearly who had freedom on his mind and one way or the other was going to try to, try to win that. Um, I think about, you know, what Robert Smalls could have done. The, after he commandeered the planter, uh, it made, as you can imagine, an enormous amount of, of press and, and PR, particularly in the North. He was, uh, you know, he traveled up to New York and traveled to Washington and was really something of a celebrity from what I read. And he could have lived the rest of his life very comfortably. He could have gone and, and, you know, kind of lived the celebrity circuit at the time. But he really believed so much about his people and, and the low country here, he came back, and he came back into the crucible. Uh, he, you know, as we all know, he, he came back and worked on the planter as a, as a Union vessel, was I think the first captain of the United States military <coughs> vessel. Um, and there were even stories of, there was one story where the Union captain at the time who was, commanding the planter, and Robert was, I guess, you know, in some support capacity to him. They were in a heavy battle, and the captain actually fled. He, you know, lost his nerve and, and went beneath deck, and Robert very skillfully and, uh, you know, with an enormous amount of, of just bravery was able to maneuver the planter out and save his life and the planter and, as well as the, the captain's life. Um, and so, again, I think, I, I feel you know, with his ability to, again, to say, okay, I've got to take the reins of this situation and I'm going to make it happen. Uh, 
He also, obviously, after the war, came back to the literature, came back to Buford and served in a variety of capacities, and uh, including, as the mayor mentioned, meeting with the president, President Lincoln, to lobby him to allow former slaves to be admitted into the Union Army. And uh, you know, some historians suggest that that incremental influx of, of resources was one of the things that helped the Union to, to be victorious. And so if Robert Smalls had any part in that, whether it's in his work here in Charleston or more broadly, that's something that I think uh, is a credit to, you know, to what he was all about. The other thing, you know, that, that again, I think is really important, education was so important to Robert Smalls. He did not, and legally was not able to learn to read when he was enslaved, but one of the first things that he did when he was free was to hire tutors and to, uh, to learn to read and to, to educate himself. He was, and obviously it was very important for him um, to educate his children, my great-grandmother, Elizabeth Smalls Banfield, was actually on the planter. She was two years old at the time. And, uh, you know, later on as she grew, she was actually sent up to New England, up to uh, a prep school outside of Boston to go to school. And, you know, I often sort of chuckle. I went to a prep school outside of Boston in the 1970s and found it kind of tough. I can't imagine what it was like in the 1870s uh, for her. But, uh, again, I think that just underscores Robert's you know, commitment to education and, uh, and that he was really a man of action, that he saw things that he wanted to contribute, that he wanted to do, and he was just so aggressive about making them happen. Another thing that is just enormously uh, sort of noteworthy to me is the degree of risk that Robert Smalls was willing to, to take on in his life. You know, I, as my mother mentioned, I'm in, I'm in business, and I'm actually at a point right now where I'm contemplating uh, some projects that, that actually involve some measure of risk, you know, personally, professionally, and, uh, and sometimes we all get bogged down by just day to day. You know, life has a way of throwing up roadblocks and challenges, and we all have to figure out how to overcome those things. But when I think about Robert Smalls, and the fact that he created sort of a juxtaposition of two choices in his life. When he decided to take the planner, it was he was going to be free or he was going to be dead. And, um, and, and not just him, but his wife, his, his child, his the others that were on the boat, and their families as well. And uh, it, it's not very often that these days that we are confronted with those kinds of risks. You know, I, clearly our service people, when they're abroad, they, uh, you know, they, they face life or death kinds of risks, but to you know, willfully put yourself in a position where it is one or the other. You know, it's, it's like the, the New Hampshire motto, live free or die. Um, and I, there's a, a quote by Joseph Addison uh, in, in Cato, where he says, he who hesitates is lost. And I think about in just, and, and we'll, we'll see tomorrow, all of the, the different, the, the route that Robert took and passing by the forts. And, you know, and I think about all the, the ways that if he had just erred in one small way and been caught or been found out, uh, clearly I wouldn't be here and probably a number of other folks uh, who are in this room wouldn't be here and our lives certainly would be different. So. Uh, just, again, to have that kind of vision and then the strategic ability to create a plan and then just the audacity to make it happen, I think, is something that is worthy of our praise and, and our continued uh, focus on Robert Smalls and history. Again, as the mayor mentioned, this event has been, uh, is a part of a broader agenda of activities around the sesquicentennial, 150th anniversary of the Civil War. And I know that the people who have planned this, the broader events, have been very careful to strike the appropriate tone. I mean, it is not, uh, you know, something that 
ended up with a loss of 600, 650,000 men is certainly nothing to take lightly um, or to celebrate. And so there's been a, a real careful effort to strike the appropriate tone around this. But when I think about Robert Smalls, I, I wonder if that sort of inappropriately um, understates and mutes the way that he should be treated um, at this point. Robert Smalls, first of all, uh, there were a number of achievements in his life that impacted everyone in the state, in the region, and, and, and in the country. You know, certainly I think the example of his life is one that every American can look to for inspiration. You know, we love these kind of Horatio Alger, pull yourself up by your bootstraps kinds of stories, and this is one of the biggest uh, in, in, you know, in our war. And I think it's one that, that I hope all Americans can feel comfortable um, attaching themselves to. I think about Robert's focus on education and his work in creating the public schools here in South Carolina, which are among, if not the very first, um, statewide compulsory free public school education in the country. And obviously that affected uh, people broadly. I think about Paris Island. Um, you know, that obviously, uh, Robert Smalls was very integral in making that happen. And, and so that's something that broadly impacted uh, the region and the country. I think about the fact that Robert Smalls <laughs> founded the Republican Party here in South Carolina. You know, that, uh, Never mind. <laughs> I'm joking. Pardon that. But so I say all that to say that on this day, on this weekend, in this room, around the city, I hope you'll join me in really celebrating Robert Smalls and celebrating his life and celebrating legacy that he has, the impact that he has, and the relevance that he still has, because I think it's something that, uh, that has real meaning and can be valuable to a lot of people. Those, obviously, you know, we are connected to him literally, and that's something that, uh, uh, that hopefully will, will be forever. But I, I, again, as, as history is just such an important tool, uh, I think those efforts to continue to pass along the story of Robert Smalls is just something that's just so important. So I for sure, uh, and very unabashedly and without reservation, will, will celebrate this weekend, and I hope you all will join me. I've got a few images, and I hope the technology gods will be kind to me right now. Um, I just wanted to share. Just uh, starting with a couple of pictures, some of these you may even see, um, we'll, we'll see to come. This is Robert. This is his wife, Hannah, who is my great-great-grandmother. This is a picture. This is my great-grandmother, Elizabeth Smalls Banfield, and uh, we, we called her Mama Lizzie. She grew up with my mother and my mother's parents for, I don't know, the last 10 years or so, last 22 uh, years of her life. And uh, she really, for me, is a very literal bridge to this whole story. Um, we'll show a picture a little bit later, but you know, I have pictures of her in her later life with my mother, with my grandparents, um, with things that, that I know with, that, I, that really um, you know, make this story real, and she was on the planter. <coughs> and this is her husband, Samuel Jones Bantfield, who was a lawyer and a businessman down in Beaufort. Now this is, the next two pictures are among the most precious uh, assets that I have. This is a picture of Robert Small's grandchildren. The Infant on the right, that's my grandmother, Arianna Banfield Boulware. This was taken in 1897. And uh, it was funny, when I was down here prepping this, my son Robert was looking at this and said, wow, they're, they're all girls. And I said, no, the person right in the middle there, that's a boy with the long, 
stories, but I guess the, the styles were a little bit different. But um, this is uh, this is just a great picture. And then the next one is uh, a little bit later, but of the same group. This picture was taken in Charlotte, and uh, Elizabeth Smalls Banfield is in the middle there, second from the right, and uh, my grandmother is standing on the on the left, the far left, and those are her brothers and sisters. When do you think this was taken, Mom? Is this in the 20s? Maybe the 1920s or something like that in Charlotte? This is a wonderful picture. That's Mama Lizzie, Elizabeth Smalls, Banfield in the middle. That's my grandmother on the right. Um, remind me who's on the left? And Julia on the, on the left. And uh, I think this was probably in 1959 at Mama Lizzie's 100th birthday. And uh, again, for me, you know, that's how I know my grandmother. And so to see my grandmother with her mother, again, it just sort of makes all of this history, it just brings it to real life. You know, I've saw that, it's just a little thing, but that lamp in the background, you know, I grew up with that lamp in her in living room. And so, again, to, to know that someone who was on the planter, you know, was around something that, that is tangible to me is, uh, is just really valuable. The funny thing about this picture, it always gives me a chuckle, you know, they're sitting there, and obviously it's a posed picture, but they're sitting there reading the planter, yet my great-grandmother had been blind a long time. She's blind here, so I'm not quite sure what she's, uh, what she's seeing. But it's a great picture. And then this was the picture that was up, and I think the next two are just some really, I think, stately kinds of pictures of Robert Smalls. I believe this, this one was when he was a collector of customs in Beaufort toward the end of his life. And then this picture, um, this was that moment in April of 1976 when I unveiled the bus. You recognize the handsome gentleman in the couture uh, polyester leisure suit there. <laughs> A little bit more hair, but, uh, but that's me and my grandmother to my right and cousins and I don't know if he's here yet but my cousin Joe Green is going to be here this week and that's him all the way over and my uncle Allie and Aunt Lil and cousins and this is in the sort of the courtyard of Tabernacle Baptist Church in Beaufort and it's actually for those of you who are going to be around uh, for the rest of the day it's, uh, it's also special because my sons are going to be involved in the unveiling of the various monuments uh, you know, going forward. So it, it's, it's an interesting sort of juxtaposition. But any, uh, any questions, any, any thoughts?